welcome to Legends on TVG. I'm Todd Shrupp. Tonight's guest is the colorful and talented Angel Cordero Jr. Born in Puerto Rico, Cordero arrived in the United States in 1962 and went on to a Hall of Fame career that produced 7,057 trips to the winner's circle. A three-time Derby winner, Cordero also captured four Breeders' Cup races and two Eclipse Awards. Often a betting favorite, Cordero's style and flair made him a fan favorite as well. Let's go to the Keeneland Library in Lexington, Kentucky, where Angel chatted with our own Gary Stevens. Welcome to Legends, Angel. Thank you for having me and calling me a legend. That's, <laughs> that's a very <laughs> nice compliment. Angel, your father was a jockey and a trainer. Was it just an automatic that uh, you were going to be involved in horse racing? I believe so. Both of my grandfather was jockeys and trainer from my mother's side and my father's side. Most of my uncles from my father's side, they became jockeys, and from my mother's side, they became trainers. So I guess, like you say, on our sport, I was bred to it. Uh, aside from your father, your uncles that were trainers, uh, who else influenced you as a young boy uh, growing up? My hero was Eddie Arcao. I was like, since I was a kid, my father used to bring me picture for him, and you know how you always fantasize to become somebody that is famous. That was my fantasy was become something like Eddie Arcaro. I used to try to imitate it, and he was an idol before I even met him. When you came to the United States in 1962, who helped you the most uh, just starting out? Las Barrera. He was like my father. I used to call him my white father. My father left. He said, I never left my son with anybody. He said, I'm going to leave it with you. So I used to call him daddy all the time. Coming to the United States and being a black jockey, was that difficult for you? And did it continue to be difficult for you throughout your career? When I first came to this country, it was very un uh, hard for me to understand what certain places they won't serve me. And um, I, re I remember my first hour I went in California. Uh, when the lady saw who I was, she didn't want me on it. And I didn't understand that, that kind of point. But now that I see through the history of some of the athletes, they went through a lot of things, like baseball players. And even Nat King Cole used to play in hotel. He wasn't allowed to come in on the front door. And so, you know, I realized that now, but before, it was very hard for me to understand because I didn't think I was black. I mean, I'm dark, but I didn't think I was black. I didn't speak much English, so I ate ham and egg for about two months. That's all I knew how to say. I go to the kitchen, ham and egg. And the guy said, how do you want your eggs? And I just smile. I don't care how he give it to me. I ate it. So my friend said, why do you always eat ham and egg? I said, I don't know how to say anything else. He said, well, point it to him. But then he was a lot of people in the kitchen started pointing. You know, they get on the head. What do you want? Ham and eggs. I give up <laughs> right away. When, when you first started out here in the United States, did you have any idea that you were going to reach the pinnacles in racing that you reached and have the fame that you've enjoyed throughout your career? When I started riding in New York, I realized I was way behind him. And I went home four or five times. Mm -hmm. And I always have in my mind to come back and, and do good, but I never thought that I was going to reach that high. You had uh, a, a friend and an adversary that we talked with here. And he said that one of the guys he got the most enjoyment out of beating was you. His name was Lafitte Pinkai. Oh. <laughs> make two of us. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, about, did, did you guys have a, a genuine friendship? Uh, was it a rival, rivalry? What was it with you two guys? To be honest to you, when Lafitte came to the United States, uh, he came on a contract, and he and Georgie Velasquez, which he was a great writer, they was really, really hot. And we hung around together all the time at night, and we did like friends or brother do when you play a sport. We play for pride. We play just to kill each other in the night. Well, I got you in the second race. And we really rode for laughs. We rode for anything. And we really rode rough to each other. We really play for pride. And I know he enjoyed beating me and Georgia, and I know I enjoyed beating him. But I was always, always a respect, mutual respect. I respect his ability. And to me, it was an amazing what he went through and accomplished what he accomplished. So, you know, even now to this point, I tell my kids, you know, when they see La Fiesta, I used to ride with him. I used to whip him once in a while. <laughs> Life's magic has won it. You had a reputation in New York of really being able to recognize track biases. Uh, in other words, if a track was playing to speed, if it was good two links off the, the fence, how much uh, did that influence the way that you shaped the race? Did you really pay attention to, to those things? I did a lot. 
the truck buyer, I really learned looking at the, they have this uh, piece of paper that they place on the bulletin board before the races, where they give you all the numbers, so every day to the month. And I asked somebody one time, what is that? And they explained it to me what it was. So every day before I go in the room, I used to go there and watch that. Took me a while to catch up with it, but in, in Saratoga probably worked the best. Because Saratoga was a very difficult track to ride at the time. Would you adapt throughout the day watching for uh, uh, track biases? I mean, would you actually go out there and, and try and mentally or physically change a horse's running style uh, according to how that track bias was playing? At the beginning, I did. And Lars told me that you should ride a horse according with his style is. I said, you can't take a horse that comes from behind because the track is playing speed and put him on the pace because he won't finish. I handicap more jockeys and trainers. Mm -hmm. uh, athletes create habits. Every athlete have a habit. I learned the jockeys have it. And you go yourself and you know you know them by heart what they're going to do. Anticipation is a good weapon. So I know by heart what they was going to do. You, uh, you learn trainers have it. Some trainers don't want the horses on the lead. You no matter what the race shape are, they want horses come from behind. And you got trainers that like to see the horses on the, close to the pace or on the lead. So I handicap the trainers and the rider and the track. And I spend a lot of time. I would not go to sleep if I don't read the racing phone. If it was 2 o'clock in the morning and I don't have one, I would get dressed and go get them. Would you consider that one of your greatest attributes uh, as, as a champion jockey? Or was there something else that you feel was uh, more of an overall strength? Well, it, I believe it's more than a combination of different things. Learn the habits of, uh, of your compatible, the jockeys. Like the baseball people, they tell you he can hit an inside ball or a fighter. He say he move to the left, move to the right. He can back, but he can point. So jockeys got habits too. When I learned that, and I learned trainers, and they tell you, and then horses. More important is know when a horse pull over when he made the lead. Horses that are gonna go out or gonna go in. Horses that don't wanna be trapped on the inside. So when you put it all together, it, it helps a lot. But the main thing is the horse. It's ninety percent of the outcome. The success you had at Saratoga over the years, 13 championships, 11 consecutive championships at Saratoga. What was it about the spa? To me, when I went there, it was like, it was like going into the derby. I wanted to win it so bad. I, I could break fingers. And I rode with broken elbow, broken ribs. It was nothing to stop me. I really wanted to do it. It was like, I don't care if they whip me all year in New York, but when we went to Saratoga, I was there at 5 o'clock in the morning every day, and I was there. I came out and I worked very, very hard for it. I said, God, I don't care what happened all year. I just want to win it, you know. And wanted it. The will of wanted it something is very important. You know, mind of a matter is very important. I see people walking on glasses, and they sleep on nails, and, you know, and they're human like us. I said, well, if they can do that, I said, I, I guess I can sell to myself, psych myself to win in Saratoga, and that was all. I see how passionate you are about uh, Saratoga, how dear it is to your heart. You rode a great racehorse in his last four races of his career, Seattle Slough. Where does the Slough rank uh, with the top horses that you rode throughout your career? Well, I'm probably prejudiced because I rode him. I think he was, probably, he was the best horse by no question that I ever rode. I missed the ride on a firm that won the Triple Crown. You know, I rode a firm second time he won. I rode for last most of his horses. I never thought a firm was going to be that good. That was one of the biggest mistakes I make. I, I just thought he was a horse. So don't win it on him, and he win the triple crown. It was like a breaking heart to me. I said, that is the goal of every jockey to do that. But then God, you know, prized me, got the chance to ride Seattle Slew, which if I would have rode a firm, I would have never rode Seattle Slew. And the first time two triple crown met in the history, I probably would be a long time before they met, that race to me was better than winning the Kentucky Derby. I was riding against my favorite trainer last, Steve Cotton. He was you know, one of my advocates. He, he's so good. He, he revolutionary sport. People came to the jockey room with camera when he was riding. and rode against a friend, which I thought he was not a good horse, and now he was a champion. And I got the chance to ride Shadows Lou that day. To me, that was like Muhammad Ali fighting for the championship. I was talking to this horse all over. I said, this is your chance to become famous. I said, winning the triple crown didn't mean nothing to people because he seemed like he didn't beat any good horse. I said, today is your day to be famous and make me famous. And uh, to me, when he won the Marlboro and beat a friend, that was a big goal to me. That was it. What about uh, 1974, your first derby win on Cannonade? Uh, what was that experience like? 
the night before the derby, I had this dream. My father always wanted to see me win the derby, but he passed away the year before. And I had this dream that my father was uh, a producer. He was making a movie, and I was the good guy. And I was supposed to win the derby. And he said, okay, you're gonna be there inside, and when you come to stretch, everybody's gonna move, and you're gonna go through. And it was so real in, in the dream. I woke up like four o'clock in the morning, and I said, but you don't supposed to tell you dream. In my country, you dream something you don't tell. And I didn't know what to do. I said, I dream I win the derby. I said, and it was in my mind, my father told me, you stay there, and they're gonna move away from you. You are the star of the movie. They're gonna move for you. And 23 horses got about 17 the first bar. That was on the rail. And I could hear his voice say, you stay where you are, stay where you are. Never got stopped once. Got through them almost every I only came around one horse. When I hit the quarter pole, it was like I was watching the same dream. I knew he was going to win it. Yeah, it's something that you already saw happen before. And it was weird because, you know, like, it, it was so real. I mean, he came in the dream and told me, you won't win the derby if you do this. And it happened. When we return on Legends, Angel discusses his other derby wins and his unique friendship with Howard Cosell. Coming to the way, Cole Forbes, the leader, is on his pleasure driving. It's Cole Forbes and Honest Pleasure. They're going to come to the wire together. Honest Pleasure the outside, Cole Forbes on the inside. Honest Pleasure, Cole Forbes. Cole Forbes has to come to the wire. Bold Forbes. No one thought he could get a mile and a quarter. He was known as a sprinter, but you not only win the derby on him going a mile and a quarter, you come back and you win the Belmont Stakes on him going a mile and a half. How'd you do it? When we went to the derby, I thought he had a good chance, even thought he was on a sprinter, because the favor, which he was on his place, would win his last four races on the league. Braulio was riding him, which he was a great rider, and a rider no up saving his horse like Pat Day, a guy that just moved when he had to. Leroy Jolie was his trainer, and Leroy Jolie at the time was very hot. And he has so much confidence on the horse. It's like you have confidence in yourself. So you could hit me first, you're not going to move me. So last and I was talking, and last said, you know, he said, Cordero, he said, you got to go to the league. I said, no. I said, you know what? They're going to give it to us. He said, you think so? I said, yeah, Bradley's too much of a good rider to come out of there riding. And Leroy thinks his horse is unbeatable. So they're going to say, let him go. He's a sprinter. That day, I thought we have a good chance. That horse came at him three times. And my horse wasn't the best horse I ever rode, but he got the biggest wheel of any horse I ever rode. He wanted it to win so bad that horse, he was like a person. But when we came to the Belmont, I didn't think we have a chance. Mm -hmm. I didn't think we have any chance. Last day, he said to me, Cordero riding with confidence, he have a chance. Said, you get a truck to pick me up on the car up, <laughs> he'll make it. He said, you have to have confidence on it. So he said, you know what we're going to do? You're going to get on him every day. I said, I can't gallop and he run over with me. He said, yeah, but you're only 110 pounds. He said, the guy galloped him 150, he was not with him anyway. <laughs> he said, after a while, he'll come back to you, get to know him, talk to him. And I used to go to the store and talk to him. I said, just take me to the airport. I call him the Puerto Rican Rolls Royce. I said, take me to the Apo, and I'll take that. And he came strong all the way, and when he got to the Apo, he got drunk. He was like, you, that's what you wanted? And he started going like this. I said, well, I asked him to take me to the Apo. I guess I'm going to have to pray. <laughs> I was riding and praying at the same time, and I never did that before. I mean, I prayed before the raid, but never in the raid. In the raid, you ride, and I was praying, oh, please, God. I was going to let him get beat. He was walking, and he made it anyway. But I think the training job was better than anything. I mean, he probably would have won it with anyone. I'm not trying to be humble. He trained him. Perfect. And by the way, he told me when you were young, he said, this is going to be your next pink and your next Cordero. <laughs> he pointed it to me when I first met you. He told me, he said, that will be the next Cordero, the next pink and he wasn't wrong at all. Wow. Thank you. He was very somebody who was very special in my life as well to as, me too. as you. And uh, someone else who I felt like when horse racing was the number one spectator sport in the United States during all these triple crown runs. There was a guy who used to interview you named Howard Cosell. Tell me about, did, did you have some kind of a special uh, type of relationship with, with Howard? I know that you like to poke fun at him. He was a real serious guy. Just well, he, real uh, you know, guy, he uh, happened to like me for some reason. He always wanted to help me. He knows I can speak English that good. And he prepared me before we interview. He came to my house and interviewed me twice which he usually, you know, you, you go to the studio. And he kind of go and like me on me. I don't know, for one reason, he liked me. And uh, we have a great time, and I just try to imitate it. You know, I know he was very serious. So one day, uh, one. one day we was uh, interviewed, he said to me, we're going to make this interview. It's supposed to be live, but something went wrong, so we had to tape it. He said, so you may believe we're doing this live. So 
but he didn't tell me he's going to have me, so he goes, Angel Cordero, Jr. He said, two years ago, they hated you, and I wrote colors. He said, now they are comparing you with the master, Eddie R. Carroll, Angel Cordero. Have you ever did anything dishonest? I, th I stole a couple of hood cap, I robbed a couple <laughs> of guys, nothing to brag about it. He got upset at me. This is a very serious program. So then the next time I wrote Kodak, he was interviewing Wayne, and he was going to do an interview with me, and we were sitting in the room. So he goes, D. Wayne Luca. He goes, Kodak, Santa Anita Derby, Patrick Valenzuela. He said, Hollywood Derby, Eddie De La Jose. The pregnant, Angel Cordero Jr. Why, Wayne? <laughs> 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 I had to make fun of that. At the end, he started liking him. At the beginning, I started, I said, I'm, I'm a Spanish Howard Cosell. 1985, spend a buck. You win the Kentucky Derby. There was a bonus that year to run in the Jersey Derby. After, and the connection decided not to run in the Preakness or the Belmont. Do you wish that he would have been given the opportunity to run in the Preakness and the Belmont and complete the Triple Crown? I, of course, it's a tradition. I think if the horse would have won, run in the Preakness, he would have won it because he was, you know, in good shape at the time. They did make the money with him, but I think the horse wasn't benefit about that. It's more prestige to win the Derby and the Premier than win a $2 million race somewhere else. You rode a lot of great horses throughout your career. Uh, I don't want to hear about the best one you rode, but the, was there any horse that you were especially fond of? A uh, filly named Waya. I thought she was the smartest one horse that I ever rode. She told me how to ride European horses. She, you can't make her do what you want. She told you what to do. She set herself in a spot, never moved from on, unless she had to. And I learned a lot about European horses just riding her. It was fun to ride her because I know she would take me whatever place it was. What was the best horse you rode? Seattle Slew by far. No question? No question, not even think about it. I you think Kelso, or the one that I saw, because Manu Wall is my favorite, but I never saw him run. The one that I saw run with my own eyes, I think Kelso, Secretary, Seattle Slew. That's the horses that I ever saw with my own eyes. 1992, you have a horrible spill. You're forced into retirement. You come back in 1995, very briefly. Well, I got her first in 87, and I lost her my liver. Um, I mixed up inside. I went through surgery. I was out for about five months. And I came back and I rode for a while. And then uh, my wife and I have the babies and everything. When I got here in 92, they told her that I wasn't going to make it. But 22 days later, I woke up in the hospital. She said, promise me you won't ride again. He said, you don't want to see you, you know. And I, I, at the time, I was hurt big time. And the doctor told me, you can't ride anymore. And so I quit. Then I could not sleep. And I, I just keep remembering my last ride on the ambulance. I said, so one day I said to her, listen, I can't sleep. I went like two years. I said, I can't sleep at night. I said, I'm not the same person. I said, I just want to ride one time. I said, one time. I promise you I will ride again one time. So it took me about three years. I had to convince her and my kids, my mother, and the doctor. So I figured, let me go to Puerto Rico, which I started. So I rode like seven horses. You know, I wasn't really ready. Second, Santer, one of them day when the track got wet and the gravel was soft. Then because I promised her that, and you know, I loved her dear, I could not do it, and I really wanted her to do it. I mean, I know I could do it, but I just could not do it, you know, and that's why the other, last year, you know, after all that time, I said to my kid, listen, you guys gonna have to give me a permission. I gotta ride one horse. I said, man, I've been getting the horses in the morning, and I, I wanted to win another race, and I came back from the comeback, I didn't win nothing in New York. So that place, he said, I'll put you on a horse, and every time he said, you want to ride this horse? I kind of chicken out when he came close to the race. Nah, and the horse will win. Ah, you could have rode this one. And Johnny told me, you could ride one horse. And they, you know. So finally he said, pick one. So I see this filly that won three on a row. And she won by 10, by 10, and by nine then. I said, OK, that day was big race everywhere. And he was looking for, for to go to Philadelphia. I said, I'm your man. He said, you sure? I said, I'm your man. I go and ride this filly. And she won terrible. Then you come in the tell us, how did you got that feeling? <laughs> I guess she found out I was 60 some years old and she didn't want to go far not to hurt me. Then after that, she came back and won twice. My kid doesn't know anything about horse racing. 
Somebody must have done it in the school. He said, you know, daddy, that Philly that you got, bitch, you came back on winter. I said, shut up. I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> if it comes up again, if you get an opportunity this year, somewhere along the line, and things fall into place, would you do it again? I probably would. This is my dream. Get Chris McCarron, Rafi, you and I, and Pat Day, and may one day come back, the five of us. We all retire. We all out of shape. No out of shape to ride, I mean, to, to get on a horn, but, you know, to perform on the everyday basis. But I think we're in, in good shape to just won one race. Pay-per-view, baby, pay-per-view. Anything. <laughs> you, you get five people from retirement. I can't say Steve Cotton because he got big. <laughs> you won two Eclipse Awards back-to-back. -back. Johnny's just done the same thing. Do you think that he has a chance to go on and, and break uh, every money record that's out there if he stays healthy and he continues to want to ride? Uh, do you think that that if he is wants a possibility? To, if he wants to do... He will top me by far because he has accomplished so much in such a short time. It took me years and years to win an Eclipse Award. When the opportunity came that Johnny asked me to become his agent, he's like my son. I always dream to have a son to become a Jackie. I have five children, and neither of them like horses to become Jackie. So when that guy wins a race, my tears come out. I feel like he's my son, you know? I mean, it's no, I work for him, he's my boss but he's my son more than anything. He could fire me tomorrow, he's still my son. He might pride. He's like Michelangelo, big picture. That's why I feel so proud of him. I mean, uh, I, I'm proud of him like I, you know, he's, believe me, he's my son. 20 years from now, when people say, Angel Cordero, how do you want them to talk about you? How do you want to be remembered? The guy that wanted to win the most. I know everybody wants to win, but I wanted to win the most. I mean, I mean, it was, to me it was no limit. I mean, I even rode against my wife one time, and I shot her, I shot him off the race. When she was my girlfriend, I stopped her one time, she was gonna beat me, and she came crying, why you do that? We were leaving together. I said, I could never leave, let you get through there and beat me. Then she was training, and I happened to ride against her, and I got dazed. I took her horse to almost to the middle of the track, and she came crying, why did you do that? I said, like, I don't play the game to her. I don't even let my kid beat me. I'm not a sole loser, but I wanna win. And if you beat some, I'm gonna play to you until I win it once. I just don't want to get beat. Angel Cordero, you are a legend. Thank right. you so much for being on the show. Thank you, so are you. Thank you very much. A few final observations on Angel Cordero Jr. when we return on Legends. In 1992, the spill that nearly took Cordero's life and cut short his career involved four horses. Often overlooked was the fact that one of the other injured jockeys was John Velasquez. In one incident, one Hall of Fame career ended only to help guide a Hall of Fame career in progress and give birth to a bond that will last a lifetime, much like the talents of Angel Cordero Jr. I'm Todd Shrupp for Legends. Here you are in stand-up book with the beat.